This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Um, welcome to the Metropolitan History Seminar, the last meeting of uh, the autumn term. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome our speaker, Sarah Ann Mill from the University of Westminster. Um, Sarah trained in architecture at the Macintosh School of Architecture in Glasgow, and also trained in Vienna, um, and then at the University of Westminster. Um, and spent some time working in architecture and interior design practices in London. But is now um, undertaking a PhD at the University of Westminster on the Draper's Company Archive and Architecture 1540 to 1640, supervised by John Bold and Lindsay Bowman. Um, and as you can see, our paper tonight is going to be um, on the practice of property, the Draper's Company at the state 1540 to 1640. Thank you. Yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here. I can't normally get along on Wednesdays, and I'm really looking forward to your feedback. So it's brilliant to have such a kind of packed room. I'm, I'm really excited. So uh, yeah, let's make a start. Um, so um, this title um, uh, basically uh, reflects a portion of my, my thesis, and I'll kind of be covering at the beginning half um, a summary of the Draper's Company estate, and then I will uh, move more uh, closely into the relationship between landlords and tenants in, in the estate uh, more particularly. So it's really in this reciprocal relationship between tenants and landlords um, that um, I'm interested in, and particularly how those relationships produced the built environment. And as one of the great 12 livery companies, I'm particularly concerned with the management of the Draper's Company estate. But my research began by asking what was the early modern Draper's Company like? The estate, what was it like? Um, and then I quickly moved into questions of how it worked and how it was worked out. So in approaching these questions, I'm not only interested in the material and spatial qualities of the buildings amidst the tenurial landscape of London, but how these places were uh, lived by, um, breathing, uh, by living, breathing and thinking people, how they were worked out. And in the context of the London Livery Companies, my thesis in part attempts to bridge this relational and material gap between landlord, tenant and property. So my thesis, uh, my, my focus is clearly on the Draper's Company, and my thesis assumes that livery companies beca became less tied to the business of their original trades and more tied to the business of property management, where there was intensive work in managing these estates. The difficulties of rent arrears, underlettings and subdivision of properties have been remarked upon, and my thesis um, addresses how these uh, how these uh, properties were um, were worked out in in the relationship between guild guild membership and tenants, and I hope to show that uh, something of how significant the role of the of these livery companies and particularly the drapers were in the development of city properties and the city more widely. So in this way, we were just speaking about Gadden Wallace's publication of um, two thousand one. Um, and it, Mark Jenner calls for um, more uh, studies on guild work, so I, I guess I'm responding to that, that call. <clears throat> um, so in, t in this time I hope to make contributions to three specific points of view regarding the practice of livery company property. Firstly, I will demonstrate and contextualise the growth of the estate and highlight the importance of the 16th century, something you're probably all um, mostly aware of. Uh, next, I will consider something of the complicated na nature of rental arrangements and allegiances. And finally, I will show how the preferential treatment of company members, and particularly the company governors, contributed to wider concerns about the use and abuse of company property. So throughout, I'm especially interested in the stories of property discourse as a means of understanding the way urban space was understood, experienced and ordered in the early modern period. So the research uh, intersects and builds on the detailed studies of Keane, Harding and Bear in, into property holdings in London, as well as Schofield and Orland's discussions of Tressfield's maps and uh, City Viewer's certificates. And I've also watched uh, closely the um, Clothworker study 
um, into people, property and charity and anybody interested in the charitable um, side of this discussion, um, I'd really recommend the website that's been uh, uh, put up um, relating to specific properties and their acquisition. Um, so there are limitations, of course, to this approach. Uh, William Beer of USC holds that few surveys or census reveal much about the nature or suitability of the relationship between landlord, tenant and property, and more particularly this personal relationship between landlord and tenant. In the Drapers, we have an opportunity to observe these negotiations. Abstract discussions about the nature of the estate can be embedded within the particular but only as described through the governing court, which consisted of wardens, past wardens and masters. This is especially true of the company minute books, where grievances and discussions were recorded by the company clerk. And beyond the minute books, my research is reliant on a handful of loose plans and financial accounts of the renter warden series and warden accounts, all of which need to be handled with a similar dose of care and scepticism. I, I really enjoy this, uh, this painting, which I think starts to get at the uh, what what it um, must have been like in the uh, well. It'd be lovely to hear Jennifer Bishop, but um, uh, the clerk's office. As I, as I'm working in the Draper's Company archive and picking up uh, various um, loose plans and receipts and bundles, um, uh, although the clerk, although most of the tithes or the the uh, rental payments uh, were made. Um, on, on site, I think, as opposed to in the clerk's office, I, f I find this image just actually articulates something of the uh, the complex relationship and the characters that this this company must have uh, been dealing with. So um, the 16th century is widely regarded um, uh, as the period when livery company properties, property portfolios rapidly expanded and their role as charitable trustees was strengthened. And it was based on this continued process of property bequests that the guilds, and particularly the Great Twelve, accumulated their wealth, although not all estates grew at the same time or at the same rate. Um, this di this uh, timeline is compiled based on Archer Thompson's 1942 um, study of a history of the Draper's Company properties. He was a past uh, a master and renter warden and, and began his study with a, with an interest of getting to grips with the hit the, um, the the property deeds of which there were 8,000 um, over 8,000 which had been recently well 20 years earlier surveyed so this is basically a synthesis of his synthesis um, and I think the timeline I, I wasn't sure how big the screen would be so um, uh, the, basically this is 1500 here 1550 1600 and you can see the significance um, of of bequests uh, in, or, or acquisitions and purchases uh, within that period. Uh, so uh, uh, again, it'd be helpful for me to, to, to particularly mark in the, the dissolution of the monasteries in 1540s. So um, yeah, just about here. Uh, but this actually doesn't seem to have had uh, 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 much of an impact um, it, although the reasons behind the quest, I'm sure we could um, nuance, uh, but you can see as a whole the, the significance of the 16th century, uh, uh, even with the Chantry Act um, and the dissolution, was, was fairly uh, constant. So only seven properties were acquired before 1500, whereas 50% of the pre-fire estate was, uh, was acquired between 1500 and 1550, and a further 20% in the 50 years preceding this. So um, this diagram should really be, um, when you're reading it, you should keep in mind that this also reflects, or at the same time, there was a wider cultural shift in the meanings of real property, which uh, worked towards a hardening of the notion of property in land, and um, the, um, the concretization of usages into property, uh, which could be rented, sold, or willed, um, so this was often tied, this idea is often more tied to country estates, but livery companies can give us particular insights into the ur urban circumstances of these, of these shifts. So um, three um, quick ways in which the, um, 
these properties were acquired bequests, so um, these were uh, uh, particularly properties that were um, given by past members uh, to, to work out various uh, charitable um, uh, means, uh, certainly after the, the Chantry Act. Um, there were purchases on behalf of uh, members, so using cash um, bequests and then corporate purchases. Um, so another 11 properties, if we look after 1600, were counted to the Drapers before 1666, where this timeline uh, finishes. And uh, such statistics clearly indicate the increasing number of sites owned or entrusted to the company and the explosion in scale of the estate in the 16th century. Um, commenting on the companies as a group, Keane and, and uh, Harding considered that such growth in urban properties had virtually ceased by the end of the 17th century, and um, I think the, the Joe Cruz um, follows that kind of pattern. So, the, yeah, this just situates those properties on, on a, uh, the Agas map of 1560, um, and although um, this graphic... Uh, the graphic before demonstrates that swell of properties entering the portfolio between 1500 and 1600. It's, it's important to keep in mind that that uh, diagram does not indicate the size, the value, nor the number of individual dwellings represented by the acquisitions, which were identified, um, which are identified only by a, a single dot for the location. Um, so, for example, the Erber contains approximately 16 separate dwellings at the time of purchase and uh, the goat on Cheapside represented at one time one tavern with no internal separations or uh, divisions. So, following the precise increase and decrease in the quantity of the dwellings on any one site, the subdivisions, conglomerations, demolish demolitions or constructions is an ever more slippery exercise uh, in this context. <laughs> <laughs> the question of the estate's gross rental value, a reasonable indicator of significance, should be added to this assessment. As has already been noted, deciphering company finances can be a tricky endeavour in terms of accuracy and survival as well as extent of recordation, which could considerably vary from year to year. But taken at face value, the reign of Elizabeth saw the rental value of the company's la lands rise by almost 40%, excluding funds raised by the significantly increased practice of fining tenants upon renewal of leases. Similarly, the merchant tailor's gross rent income rose from 400 in the 1560s to 700 in the 1590s. <coughs> So by the end of the century, drapers were um, situated, by the end of the 16th century, drapers were situated behind the mercers and merchant tailors in terms of rental income, uh, based on other um, uh, figures, but still firmly within the upper tier of livery company estates. Um, so um, the top is uh, based on um, yeah, the, the lay subsidy in 1412 and those are the um, the five that were recorded in that in that subsidy in terms of the, the companies and then uh, 1541 as drapers were just about to make a, a very uh, two substantial uh, purchases which we'll come back to um, they were assessed um, uh, it, it, to some extent although we don't we don't know, we know exactly what that uh, was based on um, uh, as the top uh, company and then um, they were number eight by uh, 1582 based on the, the lay subsidy. So those are indications, they're not, um, we can't take them, uh, they, they're not directly relatable to 1412 uh, but they do provide an indication that drapers were at the, in the upper uh, tier of the, the great livery companies in terms of wealth which was mostly based on their properties. Um, so it's important to note that the rising number of properties and rents stewarded by the company did not necessarily reflect an increase in profit or funds available to the company. Writing in 1975 um, of the early modern goldsmiths, Redway held that the importance of bequests which enabled property acquisition was enormous, and yet his view is that the immediate importance, save for the office work involved, was often small. He clarifies that reversions had to be watched, but they brought no immediate income. 
it could be decades before the company could claim the majority of rental income for themselves. But the extent to which the, the company financially benefited from its increased number of properties is contentious. Um, Redway, what, what is true is Redway calls office work, what he calls office work should not be underestimated. And that is um, really what I, what I, I guess I'm, a, I'm attending to uh, in this talk more than um, a discussion of the, um, the financial benefit to the, to the corporation. So among uh, many other things, London can be seen as a city both characterised by tenurial re relationships and guild relationships. Surveying 1550 to 1700 bear estimates that perhaps three quarters of London households were tenant occupants, whereas for Rappaport, three quarters of all men were, were members of companies. The overlap between tenancies and company membership must surely have been significant, and this fact should colour our reading of the Draper's records. Further, tenancy and landlordism were by no means exclusive. Responsibilities and attitudes between the two could be complex. If so many company members were tenants, just how significant were livery companies as landlords? Against a backdrop of thousands of London, of tens of thousands of London landlords, as estimated by Beer, the, te the, the Great Twelve companies surely held a diverse range of properties across the parishes within and without the walls, which you saw in the, the previous uh, map. And in contrast, the lesser companies might hold only one or two. Uh, but um, taking institutions as a whole, uh, Beer presents this statistical appraisal, um, which is based on 603 cases from the post-1666 uh, fire court. And these were cases brought in relation to, brought to court uh, in relation to the burned out inner city London lands. It was only relating to uh, the land that was caught by the fire. And um, uh, in this context, Beer suggests that this might be something like an 8% sample. So it's um, by no means conclusive, but it does, uh, mm. it does show that institutions of which the church and hospitals accounted for uh, nearly 40% of all owners. <clears throat> so uh, what remains clear is that the Drapers were endlessly dealing with the running of their properties at the highest level. And if you, I mean, I've, I've spent quite a lot of time in the minute books and you can really see this uh, clear um, shift from around the 1540s where the disputes coming to court were mainly of between uh, guild members in relation to um, the trades uh, to uh, say the 1590s where it seems like the majority of disputes are coming in between tenants. The number of tenants uh, burgeoned so from uh, 9 in 1413 to 24 towards the end of uh, the 15th century, 83 were in 1595 and 103 by 1612. So um, in this context, I think um, I need to um, just tell you a little bit more about the accounts that I've been working with um, in relation to the property. Um, how, was such this, how was such growth in value, scale and number of tenants managed? The overarching view is one of constant review. The most effective and efficient means of estate management was a topic under regular consideration by the Drapers. The management of property portfolio seems rarely to have settled on an ideal, a number of different strategies being employed throughout the period. Uh, the company flitted back and forth on whether to employ a renter, so that is a, a separate uh, employed um, uh, um, uh, man, not necessarily a, drapers, a draper, um, who would manage the day-to-day -day running of the properties. Um, this was uh, kind of placed in opposition to um, the renter warden, who was a member of the Draper's company, uh, the livery, and was third uh, in order of, um, of, of priority. Um, interestingly, the, the third warden was often the youngest and the least experienced, which is, is, which is intriguing because the, the renter warden was dealing very closely with the estate finances and the finances more, more generally. So the Drapers throughout the 16th century um, uh, changed the actual managerial structure of the estate between having a renter warden um, 
uh, who was um, given the position for life and uh, having two renter wardens uh, essentially cover that job who were livery men and then back to having one renter warden who was annually elected with um, an under renter um, and then the renter warden taking um, uh, more control of, uh, of, these, uh, of these detailed financial accounts. So with this in mind, the drapers required the renter warden to keep careful accounts of cash flow, enabling them to be supervised and providing some protection against abuse of this position. In 1556, an order was made that the renter visited the houses to receive the quarterly rents of the renter warden to accompany him and to and receive the rents into his, cust into his custody. Sorry, quarterly rents of tenants. Um, so the renter warden was accountable for these sums. He was in charge of the um, of accounting for the ordinary charges, the quit rents, um, the reparations, and uh, the 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 company stuff. So timber, materials for building. Dealing with these large sums of money presented an opportunity for to profit from this great flow. The accounts were fashioned as the means by which such abuses could be detected, and the system was not unique. Um, uh, but abuses did occur. Mercers suffered serious mismanagement of funds in the 1560s by renter wardens, and drapers too were plagued by accounting problems to a lesser or greater extent. In 1555, the company at uh, the court complained that accounts were often brought in late. Uh, they were left disappointed by the amount of money returned to them, whereof they could not furnish their business accordingly. It was with much difficulty that the accounts were prized from the renter warden to the extent that it would cause the company great inconvenience to get them back. The solution was for renter wardens to put in one or two sureties to make a just and true account of all sums as such shall come into their hands and a fine of £40 was imposed for those failing to execute their office. By the 1620s the true record of the company had fallen into decay and in 1628, the renter warden was accused of ill husbanding the company's money by suffering of their needless taking up of interest monies and their payment monies of use monies for the same. When he, contrary to ancient custom and, and consent of the company, having taken great sums of the company's money out of their common hall into his own dwelling house. So as we were discussing before, it's not just records, it's, it's uh, money and investing it for his own gain, for his interest monies. Um, in response, the renter warden's accounts were to, see, were to receive greater scrutiny. In November of the same year, the new renter warden was, re was requested to keep a running total of his accounts for the greater clarity of the court. Later, the following year, further, um, more explicit instructions were issued regarding this. The renter warden was to keep a case book of all his receipts and payments, which should be written in his own hand and uh, placed at all times in the, in the parlour on the table so that any member of the court may access it. Uh, subtotals were, running subtotals were to be kept so that the time of a sitting of court um, that it would be laid open at the most recent page for all in attendance to have a better understanding of the financial si situation of the company. The position of renter seemed uh, to increase in, the pre in, in prestige in the periods that I've been looking at. So uh, the renter, um, uh, as opposed to the renter warden, uh, was uh, more often seen as a position of charity for misfortunate drapers. They're, they frequently are coming to the court um, asking for um, uh, charity on behalf of themselves and their family and uh, are, are uh, one was uh, deemed destitute about 1610, uh, but by 1634, eight, eight suitors presented themselves for the role, and one of whom was uh, an assistant of the company, so a former ward warden, and another was a member of the livery. And um, here you, you've got um, John Isham, who was um, a grocer's renter warden. He's actually, in the, in 16, uh, in the 1560s, he's actually chosen to be represented in his... Um, in his uh, renter warden um, attire with his accounts in the back there. Um, so uh, one, of the, um, one of the types of evidence that I've been dealing with are the company plans. Um, 
uh, mainly loose plans, but um, you probably will all know uh, Ralph Tresswell's surveys of the Cloth Workers Company, and there's no equivalent plan book for um, the Drapers Company, and that, that uh, document still stands as an astonishing uh, piece of work. Um, but here I've, um, I've actually uh, started to draw up the uh, ownership of the lands uh, based on Tresswell's uh, uh, Tresswell's plans. So Tresswell often draws a property and then next door he will name uh, who owns the land or whether it's a company that owns the land. So this is based on uh, those surveys and uh, in blue are the cloth workers properties. Um, so these are uh, independent blocks. So you can take each one of these on a separate page within the cloth workers plan book. Um, and then you've got um, the individuals, so th this is non-guild uh, ownership of the adjacent lands. Um, and then um, this is ownership of the land adjacent to the cloth workers, which were, uh, which were ha uh, held by uh, livery companies. So I think this, this, I find it quite interesting going through those and actually seeing the extent to which livery companies were uh, owning land adjacent to one another. Um, and I suppose that kind of survey, although it, it, it doesn't, uh, again, very, very inconclusive as, as Beer's sample of 7% was, it gives us some indication of um, what might be going on in inner city, city, city London. So I want to pull out from the detail of the renter warden and turn to articulate something of the complicated relationships which resulted from this patchwork work of urban estates. And these relationships are uh, those that are um, recorded by the Draper's uh, court. And as I said before, those are mediated. It seems in the context of inner London that livery company lands could remarkably often be situated adjacent to one another. And as indicated, tenants of one guild could rent from another, leading to managerial disputes. The densely woven web of rental arrangements, combined with a restlessness in the occupation of land, was reflected in the, dynamic, in the dynamic between individual members of guilds and their governing courts. Uh, so uh, here, the, these are two where drapers and cloth workers are particularly situated adjacent to one another. Um, and yeah, this one down here is Cornhill. Um, and this is Tresswell's uh, plan as published in Schofield. Um, so the, the patch, that's, I find this one particularly interesting because it has... Um, the draper is just here. Only in that room uh, is, is, is that the draper's land. Um, and it's next to carpenters. Um, it's got Harwood up until this extent and then Collins at the side. Uh, you begin to see something of the complexity of these uh, spaces. So although sharing a preference for housing their own me members to one degree or another, a point that I shall discuss later, uh, members of the drapers who were tenants of another company were as open to mistreatment as any other. One particular case is noteworthy for the way in which an individual dispute spilled over into an intercompany situation. In 1556, William Barlow's case was discussed by the Draper's Court. As a draper, he had been a tenant of the grocers in a tenement located next to the goat on Cheapside, which belonged to Draper's. He reported he was granted his tenancy with the goodwill of Alderman uh, John Ayloff, uh, a grocer, and others of the grocer's court, and he duly moved in. He was later taken by surprise when a warning arrived from the, from the grocer's court to vacate the property so that a grocer might have occupation of the same tenement. It was claimed that his lease was void, for crucially, crucially it was not penned in their books. A reference back to the increasing importance of importance of the company's centralised record keeping in relation to its property. Barlow had essentially been forcibly evicted. There are, there are hints here that he was a victim of another company's rental black market, whereby governors might pocket profits directly for themselves by issuing leases without any centralised confirmation of the lease. In respect that Barlow had been so evil-handed by the grocer's fellowship, the drapers retaliated. They threatened to evict a fellow, dra fellow grocer from one of their properties and picked, on <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and picked on Robert Harrison, who appears to have occupied the, the adjacent tenancy on Cheapside. 
They stated that if Barlow were reinstated to his present tenement, the Draper, all would be forgiven. To save his lease, Drapers required Harrison, the grocer, to present himself in front of his own court, the grocers, to make labour and obtain the goodwill and respect of Barlow. It is unclear whether Barlow was given leave to return to his let after these negotiations, and yet, despite the ill treatment of their own tenants, in the end, Drapers were lenient on Harrison, the grocer, who had been innocently, to some extent, caught in the company crossfire. His wife approached the Drapers for a longer lease of their house, on which only five years remained. It was on account of her husband's sickness, perhaps the reason for leniency, that she came to negotiate for an extended lease offering £20 as a goodwill gesture, and to undertake all reparations on the house to sweeten the offer. The Drapers, after a long debate, agreed to offer her a 21-year lease. Mrs Harrison rushed home to tell her husband the offer. She returned whilst the, the wardens were still hold, holding court. She placed £10 as an immediate table, uh, a payment on the table, got down on her knees to tell the wardens that her husband required more years than they had offered. In return, the Harrisons would immediately attend to any reparations required on the property. Such action, actions secured a further four years, added to the original 21-year lease. The densified city environment was defined not only by reciprocal rental arrangements, where the institutional landlords could be in, in dispute with each other, but also by disputes between individual tenants within these uh, uh, urban um, uh, estates. And this was especially obvious in cases where separate tenancies held by the same landlord frequently seeped into one another on upper and lower ground floors. As, Orlin, as Lena Orlin notes, it is a matter of merged buildings as well as misshapen yards. Fluid boundaries therefore led to internal negotiations which were mediated by the company court at any time during a lease period. This process can be illustrated in the houses of William Heather and Richard Carville. In 1634, their houses on East Cheap were described in some detail. However, it was agreed uh, and, and uh, the lease was granted to Heather. Um, but at that moment, it was agreed that a room on the north side of the property, which lay over the kitchen and also a garret on the very top floor, were taken from that house and laid to the house now in the occupation of Richard Carville adjacent. Heather further agreed to lease the cellar under his shop to neighbour Carville. A new lease was also granted to Carville in the same terms, but providing he not alter his stall or passage into his house to the prejudice of the said Mr. Heather, but to suffer the same to continue as how it is. Carville was evidently less pleased to be deprived of his garret and cellar, and the possibility of, of uh, actually acting out this uh, discontent in, in the sight of the passage uh, is possible. The case is typical, uh, is, is typical of the way in which storage and commercial space could be let out independently from that of domestic space, but still be independent on access, uh, still be dependent on access routes which traverse tenurial boundaries. As the drapers mediated between tenants, some, some could be prioritised over others. In 1621, Roger Glover requested a lease of the back warehouse and cellar under his house near Tar Tower Street. It was then held by Thomas Shawcross. Drapers assented to the dividing of the, of the space, but three years later it becomes clear that this was an acrimonious division and indeed decision. Shawcross had refused to give over any of his warehouse to Glover's. To Glover. Uh, in the manner of the city viewers, the wardens and a few assistants were therefore call called in to survey the site in order to clarify which part should be utilised by whom. A kind of compromise was reached after, four, after three years of conflict. You all know that, between, that the link uh, between the development of a survey, the map and the conception of property has been effectively made. Estate maps of the 1570s and 80s are often seen as a statement of ownership, a symbol of possession, uh, as no written survey could equal. 
Because the map or plan turns on the relationship between a person and a thing, we can be tempted to read the abstract space depicted as de-socialised. But this was clearly not the case. Harvey, st Harvey states that while maps were little understood or used in 1500, by 1600 they were familiar objects of everyday life. In the Draper's Company ar archive, this appears to be borne out in more everyday circumstances of property management, where plans were used for profitable negotiations, yes, but not, nego not negotiations stripped of their social meaning. Recognising the increased value of their estate and the swing of power towards them as landlords, the Drapers produced a string of on-site rough surveys catalogued as loose plans in the archive and deployed them to their benefit. Their ephemerality is striking in comparison to Treswell's beautifully rendered clothworkers' plan book, um, but the Drapers have two of their own beautifully produced plans for different purposes. These were clearly purposed for the short term and uh, were working drawings for working conversations surrounding the value of a property. Although Drapers <coughs> accommodated all three merchant groups uh, defined by Stowe, so namely navigation, uh, invection and negotiation, it seems to, to have been especially defined by the middle and lower sort of uh, housing for merchants. A typical example um, is here on Walbrook, uh, where we have some insight into the circumstances for the production of the plan. This, this was uh, shown just back here as well, it's one of this, this group that have survived, I'm sure there were more. The minute book suggests that the inventory of the Walbrook house was probably produced on account of a view by the wardens to ascertain the value of the house. As indicated on the plan, the tenant, Mr Eastcourt, applied for a new lease of 21 years in July 1623. After assessing the value of the let through a site visit, the plan was presumably drawn up as evidence to support Draper's case. The wardens decided that the fine for the new let would be £150. Eastcourt only offered 20 The company unsurprisingly ceased negotiations, holding Eastcourt's offer to be very unfit. And yet the court was willing to give Eastcourt the benefit of time to reconsider his offer, his rejected offer. By March 1624, Eastcourt had agreed to £120, so 30 less than, uh, than what Drake was uh, originally requested, and the rent remained the same. Perhaps the plan was produced to convince Eastcourt of its value. This practice of viewing properties first hand and laterally recording them was a system which enabled the drapers to review and maintain their estate at regular intervals. Once or twice a year there were formal views of properties followed by dinner and throughout the year wardens and employees such as the carpenter, the company uh, carpenter, would be called to site for ad hoc dispute resolution. In terms of letting and rebuilding, this was not the laissez-faire landlord depicted by Beer as hands-off and eternally keen to sublet their properties to others who could manage it, although um, there is definite evidence um, that there was um, there was plenty group that there were plenty uh, groupings of properties that were sublet. Um, but I think we it's it's wrong to characterise them as as uh, as just wishing to, to offload the management of their properties because there were profits to be had. Uh, through through good corporate management. Through negotiations on site and in the company parlour, profitable leases and rebuildings which maintained the value of the estate were continually sought. For example, in 1635, the four wardens visited site and measured out the said ground in situ in, or in order to direct good, uh, John Goodwin's Smithfield house um, they also stated the manner and fashion in which he was to rebuild it, which is typical um, of, of the, the period of time after the um, Stuart Royal Pro proclamations um, regarding the materiality and form of rebuilding. The increased pressure on city land at the time has been well rehearsed, um, uh, so from 1550 to 1666. In 1550, perhaps 40,000 uh, inhabitants were within the walls and then um, by six, before 1666 perhaps 100,000. So this represented a uh, doubling the density of people per acre of 100 uh, to 200 across the same sort of period. Um, the swing of power inevitably shifted to the landlords in the city. Schofield has identified the 
90s as an especial decade in which some might see um, the growing housing crisis um, uh, more clearly. Certainly in 1587, the merchant tailors declared that a great number of freemen in this mystery are destitute of housing. In respect of the high average quality of tenements and regulated institutional structure which facilitated dialogue between tenant and landlord, the companies were sought out by potential tenants as landlords. In this context, to what extent uh, did drapers prioritise members and support their brethren? In their estate more broadly, only 20% of properties appear to have been uh, tenanted by drapers in 1549. So that's, um, that's looking at the, the renter um, accounts. Um, this figure seems uh, quite low in comparison to what um, I would have expected based on the negotiations coming to court. But by 1612, this figure had, gr had grown by 10%, so almost a third of properties were actually leased uh, to members of the overall company estate. Uh, these figures are provisional and estimated as a result of the difficulty in conclusively identifying some tenants as either drapers or drapers' widows. This apparent lack of members as tenants can be read usefully against processes of occupation at Drapers Hall in Throgmorton as representative of an especially well-endowed plot with an extraordinary history. So I referred back uh, in uh, 1541 um, on the eve of making two uh, important purchases uh, and the two important pur pur purchases the Drapers made are depicted um, here in the early, um, they, were, they were made in both in the early 1540s. Um, the one on the, the right is, is the Erber, um, <coughs> situated at the top of Dowgate Hill, um, and um, on the right is um, Throgmorton, which included the company hall, which was mainly based around this courtyard here, and the, the company hall itself was, was the, this is a ground floor plan, it's just over here. But around, um, uh, around each of these um, courtyards and uh, clustered around the company hall and then in this case another um, hall to the fore were um, various types of properties and particularly in Draper's Hall um, uh, there were um, a series of quite uh, substantial merchants' houses or houses at least fit for merchants um, and in the Erber we see a kind of more varied uh, topography and interaction between different types and sizes of properties. Um, so the financial arrangements surrounding the acquisition of these are murky, but the minute books reveal something of the attitude of the court towards the purpose of its estate in these purchases. The governing court of the company on uh, in March 1543 sat down to discuss the potential purchase of Thomas Cromwell's old hall at Throgmorton Street, of which this this is, um, to show and declare their minds. Some were concerned that the purchase, after uh, the Erber, would be more pleasant than profitable. Others wanted assurance as to the rental value of the lands if they were separated into tenants as in times past. So before Cromwell uh, bought up all the various parts of this estate, they had been um, uh, separate uh, dwellings. This separation would allow the lands to be given to drapers of, uh, of this said company as such do lack houses to dwell in. And this is in the 1540s. In this way, they argued, the purchase may be both profitable and pleasant. And the final consideration, the decision to purchase the property, was on account of the fact that the company uh, lacked houses to dwell in. <coughs> this purchase was explicitly purposed for drapers suggesting that the Erber, for which there are no equivalent discussions or concerns uh, uh, surrounding the draper's occupation of it, um, was acquired for a, a different intent, or at least service drapers with less uh, intensity. And perhaps this is linked more closely to a desire for uh, financial profit through lets. Soon after, the prioritisation uh, of uh, as a place for drapers in Throgmorton was reiterated. The assistants, once again, a few months later, agreed that drapers should dwell therein to the avoiding and disbarring of all others. To this end, the decision made at the first meeting was read out once again 
um, in the next meeting to ensure that those who were absent could not excuse themselves because of ignorance. It was obviously of high importance. In terms of the Throgmorton site, a survey of the occupancy reveals no vacancies for the period of 1556 to 1630 and a consistently high proportion of drapers as tenants. More than this, Throgmorton was clearly tenanted by those of the company, higher, um, the higher levels of the company and successful merchants of other companies. Uh, they were mainly the, notable, the notably successful merchants of other companies rather than those of lower status reflecting the types of properties um, in the Throgmorton city block. Following um, Mr Roach, who was a Lord Mayor who um, inhabited the head house, was six times former master John Sadler, who was then followed by Lord Mayor Sir John uh, Colthorpe, who was subsequently followed by the Garway family, who were um, increasingly influential and affluent. In all, uh, the Throgmorton site could claim that it housed at least one serving warden or master um, for a third of the years between the mid-16th century and the Civil War. So to put it another way, more than two-thirds of the drapers who leased properties at Throgmorton served as a warden at some time in their career, and more often than not, they served whilst they were named tenants of the property within Throgmorton. So perhaps this reflects a trajectory of success for drapers who took up tenancy um, as liverymen uh, within Throgmorton tended to uh, uh, become wardens at some point. In 1576, uh, as if rehearsing their earlier 1544 decision about the purposes of their lands, a formalisation of a previous practice was entered into the company ordinances for the first time. So their previous um, order was a, a discussion, uh, um, uh, came out of a discussion, um, and it was a, an order that was not actually penned within the ordinances, so it, it, was, it wasn't quite uh, as concrete. It was thought that those of the property of the company were more likely to maintain their houses in good condition, perhaps because they could be more easily disciplined and were known, per known personally. Hands-on management could lead to greater profits. In 1557, it was found a stranger was re residing in Simon Horsepool's house in Cornhill. This was not unusual. Horsepool was warned to inhabit therein, per therein personally or else he lose the benefit of his grant thereof. If the lets were to be made outside the company, the court was anxious to personally know those dwelling in their properties and refused license unless those, uh, those proposed subletters could be presented in court. In 1550, a general review of the processes by which grants of leases were made was undertaken. Um, tenants, executors and assignees were taking liberties in passing on their lets without license of the centralised company and an act of parliament had prompted drapers to take note of all inmates. These were uh, tenants at will lodged within properties or uh, by unlawful subletting. In order that, uh, it was ordered that passing such lets on to outside the company must be agreed by special consent of the master and wardens. The application was to be handed in in, in writing and recorded by the clerk in the book of records remaining in the hall. Leases were not confirmed until a draft had been written and engrossed, even though verbal pr promises were routinely made, as in the case of um, uh, that we heard earlier of the the, um, the Cheapside case, where the, the lease um, of Barlow wasn't actually penned in the um, the grocer's company uh, documents, and therefore he uh, he he couldn't really challenge that. The company's preferment of its members indeed proved frustrating to those wishing to grant their houses to others. In transferring a lease successfully, there was no doubt of personal profit to be pocketed. Um, in this context, uh, to address the way in which the company was cut out of the deal, individual drapers were required to present their subtenants before the, the court, and that was the stipulation from 1590. So Draper, Jonas Ladbrook, had a powerful supporter right in favour of a lease for himself in Gracious Street. This house was shortly to become available. On account of the Lord Chief Bacon's letter, Ladbrook was called to the, co the court to discuss. 
However, Johannes Isaac, the current tenant of the house that Labrook wanted on Gracious Street, and a draper, had apparently promised the reversion of his lease to a mercer, Richard Brinston. On account that Labrook, the draper applying for the house, lacketh a house, he matched Bryson's offer um, for the tenancy. Current tenant Isaac still refused to comply and was requested to attend the Draper's Hall to show him the order in order to show him the 1590s order, newly penned, which stipulated preferment of Drapers in leases. Well supported Ladbrook, with his letter, was duly granted the lease. Unwilling to admit, admit defeat, however, Bryston, who had served his apprenticeship with the Mercer, came to the Lord Mayor and Court of Aldermen requesting permission to be bound into the Draper's company. So there's clearly a close relationship there. And Draper's refused, uh, citing the reason was to have continuous continuance in our worshipful house. As demand for leases grew, it became common practice for potential tenants to request the reversion or uh, next tenancy of a house. Open to members and non-members, this resulted in complicated and lengthy lists which the company struggled to keep track of and consistently attempted to reform. And I think there's often uh, key moments where they actually deliberately forget uh, these, these lists. Demonstrating this market for a lease in 1553, a previous tenant of Draper's um, requested the avoidance of any tenement, any tenement pertaining to this house being of the rent of five pounds or under. He was willing to wait up to six years for one to become available and Draper's agreed to grant him the same as long as he personally occupied it and did not sublet it as we heard before. Yet waiting lists were not always adhered to and Draper's could still overtake other long waiting suitors of other companies for their properties. In March 1571, two suitors from outside the company had toiled against each other for months in the court for the reversion of a property in Corn Hill, making their cases to the, the assistants. But both were left uh, bitterly disappointed when a draper was prioritised ahead of them at the last minute. Upon presenting himself, the draper, Thomas Catcher, was immediately granted the lease, acknowledging their disconsent uh, Acknowledging the disconsent, their decision was likely to provoke. The court added the proviso that uh, Catcher, um, that, that he satisfy and set content the previous two applicants, so those uh, non-members, to the end that this company may be no further troubled by the same by any of their suits. Thinking more holistically about the state, the estate, in their pursuit of a company lease, drapers and non-drapers alike drew attention to their important supporters. Writing on behalf of particular tenants, some letters can be found preserved in the archive, presumably only a fraction of the original total. Johnson, uh, the, um, what is sometimes uh, called the company historian um, in the early 20th century, um, counts 12 remaining in the company's possession, including Lord Buckhurst, Lord Warwick, Sir, Van Sir Francis Walling uh, Walling Walsingham, the Bishop of Winchester. These tended to have an impact, securing better leases for those applying in receipt of such a letter as demonstrated with Ladbrook and Lord Bacon. But in attending to and often actioning these letters, potential tenants could resort to considerable deceit attempting to capitalise on the court's desire to assist drapers who needed houses, one Leonard Piddock apparently sought to outflank George Stanismore, a tenant of a house near Soper Lane and Watling Street. Stanismore's lease was shortly due for exp expiration. Uh, he was not a draper. The company's preferential practice and acknowledgement of the letters of support was apparently well known enough for Piddock, a draper, to go to the lengths of, a, of obtaining a forged letter in his attempt to secure a lease. Piddock began his campaign early, more than a year before Stanis Moore's lease expired. In July 1583, a letter arrived at Draper's Hall uh, claiming to be penned by Lord uh, Burley, pretending <coughs> petitioning the master and wardens of the company to grant a lease to Piddock. The argument rested on the assertion that this house was a place meet for his trade of draper. 
The reliability of the letter became more clearly questionable, for the next letter received by Burley a few months later stated that, I do assure you to my remembrance, I know not the said Leonard Piddock. Further, in regards to his, to, to his support of Piddock in the next tenancy, Burley, Burley proceeded to note that neither do I presently remember any such member, and then went on to undermine Piddock, who alleged to have procured a letter without his knowledge. Burley wrote uh, rather to preserve Stanismore in his lease so that he might not be led to his undoing as a result of his lack of a lease. Clearly this was a sought after let, whether we, uh, no matter whose story we believe, and there was an implication uh, of that in its location, uh, which was, uh, uh, if we go back to the earlier um, uh, big map of London uh, with the sites plotted on it, it seemed to be particularly um, a cluster of drapers around there. As seen within Draper's Hall, not all drapers were shown the same advantage. Uh, so, as seen within Throgmorton Street, not all drapers were shown the same advantage in relation to properties. Or at least, those higher up in the company hierarchy had more direct access to the leases of fair houses. Sutton writes that this was a widespread guild practice. She takes it that mercers always had a first choice of leases and that inevitably those at the top of the pile were able to engineer the greatest personal profit. Evidently aware of this issue, a number of measures were taken by the governing court, which suggest that there were efforts to minimise the opportunities for corruption. Entered into the ordinances of 1550 was the order that no lease to, was to be granted or sealed without the agreement of the company aldermen, if there were any at that time, master, four wardens and six assistants. This equated to a committee of a minimum of 11 people. Further, in 1553, it was ordered that no warden or master should procure a lease for any time that they be in office. In 1554, it was noted that for that year, the wardens and master may not grant any more leases to themselves or their families. The fine for doing so was set at a hefty £20. Furthermore, in 1589, the court ordered that the leases must be granted by a full court of assistance only. And yet, wardens could consistently obtain leases for their friends, relatives and employees. Um, I bring this up uh, partly because uh, it was highlighted earlier as one of the um, sites at which cloth workers and drapers uh, occupied adjacent tenancies. So here we've got the draper's land in the tenure of John Hall and then again the grocer's land uh, in tenure, um, can't quite see the name there. Um, but yeah, so we've got grocers, drapers and cloth workers all working out in this Abchurch Lane um, and St Nicholas Lane uh, block. So in 1556, Mr Dimmick, an assistant of the draper, secured a house in Petty Wales, Thames Street, for his sister-in-law. Um, in, in the 1620s, Warden John Hall assist, assigned four tenants in St Nicholas and Abchurch Lanes to his father. Apparently living nearby to the Erber in 1608, Sir Thomas Hayes, a draper and Lord Mayor of London for 1614, uh, um, approached the company in regards to a tenement in Dowgate uh, on behalf of a friend of his, and later in the year he petition, petitioned again for the company to grant a further vacant tenant um, on Dowgate to um, uh, Thomas Darnton, whose wife was a nurse to his children. He was successful on both counts. More widely, there seems to have been a simmering discontent surrounding the usage and attitudes towards the company's lands, um, uh, which continued well into the 17th century. Were the, bequ were the bequests invested in property being principally deployed for the profit of the company or profit of the governing court as individuals? Archer reports of a cloth worker, Thomas Laitware, criticising the court of cloth workers in 1600, exhorting that the assistants were pelicans and did suck out the blood of their dam and weed, uh, and weed out the profit of the company's lands, which were right, which are which of right belongeth, and was given to them of the handicraft of this company. Certainly, some property bequests came with the stipulation that they should be inhabited by drapers, 
for the general maintenance, upholding and sustaining of the body and members, whilst others were unspecified. But Laitwer is focused in his critique of the company's governor's pocketing um, uh, of personal profit. A more fraternal view um, is put forth by, uh, in Stowe's updated survey of 1633, where the leaders of the companies, uh, he state, uh, was stated, did not spare to bereave their children and kinsfolk of goods and lands for the conservation and maintenance of this worshipful company. So this view upheld, um, upheld that the court actions were actually for the good of the company, um, but were still quite drastic. Um, so notably, um, uh, if we think about bribes as a, as a, as a very uh, simple way of um, uh, perhaps this outworking of kind of personal profit, um, in the 1550s, um, uh, it's clear that the, that the Draper's Company, um, uh, the governors, the court, were accepting sums of money for the securement of lease. In 15, uh, uh, these, were, these were monies that were held to be of goodwill, and so they fell outside the formal company accounts. But payments could be made in kind too, so we see gifts for feasts uh, coming in uh, in relation to leases. But in these same years, the court decided uh, such goodwill monies needed to be at least declared and entered into the corporate accounts. The practice was further challenged in 1559, when an order was issued expressly forbidding um, payments made directly to wardens or the master. So that's all within 10 years. In 1560, it was formally entered into the company's ordinances that no bribes under colour of reward were to be taken. However, the picture is complicated, for in 1576 the ordinance was modified and the practice once again appears to be sanctioned. The four master wardens were allowed to grant leases of the property uh, of the company and the profits thereof to remain uh, to their own uses. This is a quote. Pro profits thereof to remain to their own uses without being accountants to this house. Thereof, with this condition, they exceed not in taking for the same their goodwill in granting above the value of one hogshead of wine, so the the, the size of the um, of the, the money was um, uh, limited. The relationship between this, these personal profits and the increasing corporate practice of accepting fines for leases, instead of increasing rents, needs to be further untangled. And that's a point for future research. However, incidents of this nature, which directly challenged the court on issues of corruption or exploitation in the dis distribution of properties and leases, rarely appeared in the Draper's accounts. There was no late wear speaking up against the company. The voices of dissent may have been muted in the records. Certainly, um, the, imp uh, the implementation of any fines against uh, any wardens um, uh, are uh, almost non-existent. For the line between justified favour and corruption was perhaps too slippery to be identified and uh, challenged. So um, just uh, to, to close now, in the diverse examples we have considered today, there's a common thread running through. Overlapping roles and responsibilities, as well as spatially porous properties, characterise the Draper's estate, early modern estate. And the narratives discussed reveal a company in the messy process of practising their property, of working it out, and therefore actively producing city space. For property's bundle of rights included the power to exclude others, to use and to transfer, and these were never static. As the company continually sought to manage the tenant-landlord relationship, I think we can see it navigating a new discourse as to its meaning one that intimately tied the social, political and economic to the corporate in the context of a changed and changing city. Thank you.